What's going on, guys? How's it going, Alex? Are you good? I am all right. How are you? Yeah, not bad. I had a few things to sort out with um, the house that I'm renovating. Um, but no, apart from that, it's been okay, I guess. Very nice. Hello. Hey, Fafi, how's it going? Good, good. Yourself? Yeah, not bad, mate. Uh, Redline's here as well. How, how are you doing, Redline? Me? <laughs> yes, we can. And finally, Lunatic, you've made it today. Yeah, hey, guys. Cool. Um, should we get started with an update? Um, I've got a few questions. Um but yeah, we'll get started with an update from Fafi, then we can go us uh, Redline and Alex as well for an update. Yep, that sounds good. Uh, so basically, um, it's been like two weeks now that uh, the prop passed. And, uh, you know, uh, it was a prop, so we described, or at least a Redline described some mechanisms. So the first step was, how do we get from uh, a mechanism or something which has been described in the prop to something that we can actually run and try. So figuring out the right algo, something which can work, something which we can implement. And I think we've gone through this phase, we've done that. And uh, basically we've been able to uh, implement the first version of the algorithm which was proposed in the uh, proposal by Redline, which is good. <coughs> we've started to, uh, to get some sorry to get some results which is also another uh, nice thing and of course one thing that you might be uh, less interested in uh, in the background is that there there was some work to basically uh, be able to you know to have a tool to be able to use it to package it etc so that's more technical but that was needed as well so that's what we've been up to and uh, we have put a report online we have provided like we have published um uh, an update on Friday with the links and also you can go check it out and uh, that's where we are basically so we're now in a position where we can actually start uh, tweaking the parameters of the algo having some very interesting dis discussion like where we put the peg uh, what are the impact of the various parameters and all these things so that's very good and also Alex I'm, I'm sure he's gonna talk to you about that uh, just after maybe later, has been doing some very good work uh, regarding uh, uh, the USTC supply, where it is, uh, the tokens which have moved or not moved, and, uh, you know, what, how we can basically reduce the supply for USTC. So, yep. Cool, that's a quick intro. Um, Redline, do you want to give an update from your point of view? Um, yeah, so without repeating too much of what Fafi was saying, so we're best in a position now, two weeks in, that we can perform initial uh, initial modeling and we have an initial tool set up. Um, like there still is more work to do in terms of like modifying how, or uh, with the tooling in terms of modifying the volume as the tax increases and stuff like that. So there's still quite a bit to be done in terms of, of modeling and making changes to the tooling. But in terms of having initial tooling and modeling done, I think we're actually in a great position now going forward and we're probably ahead of time in terms of where I think we are. But yeah, we're, we're in a, a good position now just with the initial modeling stages and we're moving to, to change the tooling and modify that to produce more comprehensive modeling now, basically. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, for Alex, I've got a slightly different question. Um, what's your thoughts on the news that we had uh, that SEC said, um, the judge said XRP is not a security and its impact on crypto and potentially on LUNC? So um, I think for for most crypto uh, altcoins, it's a huge deal. Um, it, like especially ones that uh, that that have a, a really American uh, kind of flavor to them, like Solana or um, you know, like like significant number of American investors, American developers, um, American management. Um, <clears throat> Um, and I actually think it's pretty bad for like the, like the, the, I, what I call them the dino coins the like, like, uh, like Litecoin or, um, B, uh, BCH or, um, e, you know, e, you know, Ethereum classic or whatever the, like the, 
the coins that are more that are that are either proof of they're like older and or like like proof of work that because it was thought that the SEC was 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 going to approve those and not approve a lot of the 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 newer proof of stake um, proof of stake ones. So this this court, I mean, um, the the ruling it like it it's. Uh, it doesn't really it doesn't really help ripple that much as far as i can tell because like like it, it, um ripple is going to have to fight continue fighting this for years this is just one ju- one district uh, judge um but but uh, and you know other district judges in the in the manhattan uh, district court um could could issue conflicting opinions or whatever but what's really good about it is that it does. Uh, you know, it is that until another case surfaces, um, you know, this is the law of the United States. Like it, it is, it is, it is officially legal to pay people in in tokens, right? It is officially legal to like you can actually run a token based business in the United States until um, until like a superior court. Um, you know, says otherwise, or this is overturned on appeal. So it's a really big deal for Americans working in crypto, and um, and for uh, and for a lot of like the newer proof of stake coins. Yeah, because if one coin uh, would be a security, it would be XRP. So if, if a judge says that XRP or selling XRP through exchanges is not a security, then yeah, a lot of the coins, especially like Solana, Cardano, are definitely not security. That's right. Cool. Um, Fafi, do you want to talk a bit more about the algo? You mentioned that you're finalizing that. Yes, absolutely. So uh, one of the big challenges that we had is, uh, as I said, was how basically do we move from uh, like something which has been written on the paper uh, to something that we can actually uh, execute some code. Right? So uh, we describe, or at least what uh, was described is, uh, you know, you have two components. You have what we call the divergence, divergence protocol and the buyback. So essentially the idea is that you're going to tax when you have a peg, so say $1. And then when the value of uh, USTC goes under this peg, we're going to tax, right? So initially, it was going to take like uh, what Red described was like, we're going to take the entire difference between the, the price, the market price, and um, basically the peg value, right? So if you're at 90 cents, you're going to take that 10% uh, of uh, the order that has been sent. Okay, and that somehow, uh, how do you uh, uh, implement that? And also, is it feasible, like with regards to the, the you know, the matching engine that is used on the sex, or if you are on the DEX uh, with the, the DEX itself, how does it work, etc. So that was the first challenge that we had. What do we do, basically? How do we implement that? Uh, basically, uh, to make it even easier to understand is that, uh, you know, do you tax before you send the trade uh, to be executed or do you tax after wise, right? So if I do, uh, for example, USTC versus uh, USDT or BUSD, for example, I'm going to give like one BUSD, which is one dollar, and I'm going to get like a quantity of USDC back. So which one do we ta- ta- tax and how do we apply that? So that was the first challenge that we had. And we thought about it, we discussed about it and all. And basically, uh, what we decided to go for was to, or one implementation that we decided, we thought about was going to be uh, like feasible, easy to be implemented, and, and something that could be actually uh, done and, and potentially and hopefully uh, showcased to the, the, par- the partners that we need, was to actually tax after a while. So, what we're saying is that uh, when you're going to have, uh, you send your, US, your BUSD, so you're buying USDC, you're sending BUSD, so you receive a quantity of, uh, of USDC, and then we decided to tax after, so on this quantity that you receive. And Doing that, it seems like a very small change. It changes, it makes it so, so, so much easier. Because 
and I'm gonna get a bit technical, but trying not to uh, uh, not too much, so people can actually understand. So if you change the order beforehand, first of all, it, it means like you're gonna have like to do some calculation, and these things have to go very fast. So it's a bit of an issue, and then you have to basically take that amount of money, put it aside. But then what happens if the order is cancelled, right? Because uh, people here, maybe they think about, uh, like, when you trade, you go, you trade on the screen, and you push a button and all, which is fine. You also have to think about a lot of the liquidity of the people trading. It's like bots, automated trading, and stuff like that. Market makers, for example. And they basically have to, like, you know, they're often going to put orders, they're going to cancel orders, etc., etc. And that can quickly be... Uh, a hell to manage, right? Because you're sending an order, I tax it, I take some money uh, aside, but then the order gets cancelled and, you know, I need to not forget to give you back the money that I put aside and all this stuff. That makes it extremely complicated. Uh, the way we went for, which is taxing afterwise, makes it so much easier. Because first of all, you don't have to do any work if the trade has been cancelled, right? And And if you think of like the big players or the market makers and all, you get plenty of orders. So that's a lot of work to do beforehand. And perhaps this work will be for nothing because the orders will be cancelled, right? So we decided to go for taxing uh, post-execution, which, as I said, makes our life much easier. And then what do we do? So you've given, like, say, one BUSD. And to make it easier, I'm going to say you've received, like, one... Uh, 90, uh, sorry, 0.90 USTC, right? Let's say that USTC is at 90 cents and we're all happy and all. So you've received like 90 cents in USTC. Well, what do we do is that we're going to take like that 10% and we're going to take it, take it off uh, the quantity that you have received. So it's really like uh, we're going to take 10 cents and we're going to take 10 cents away from you. So you're going to get only 80 cents and we're going to get 10 cents back from us. That allows us, like, for example, we can put that as a collateral and all. So we can defend the peg. Uh, the other thing as well is that uh, when we do that, basically, uh, it, it makes it, like, much easier, but also it means that we might have to tax a bit more. So that's, like, what I say when I talk about, like, the parameters. is like, how much do we take from you? So we have a USTC, which is currently depegging, and we want basically to prevent people to sell. Right? So I've made a simple example here where I say like it has depegged by 10%, and I said I'm going to take 10% away from the short seller. But we can also make that a parameter. We can tax you like more. We can tax like 20%, 30%. So these are basically uh, now the stage where we're at. We can like try these parameters and try to find the best thing between not preventing people to trade, but also preventing people to depeg or from depegging uh, USTC, which I think is quite interesting. And that's basically the, the simulations that we're doing. So we have that implemented and uh, that's pretty cool. I think that's a nice milestone. And now we can tweak actually this algorithm and trying to see uh, what works best. So to summarize and make it very simple, uh, we're going to tax post execution and we're going to take basically uh, like the difference between the peg value and the market value. So when I say market value is the price that you're going to see on screen with Binance or Kraken or whatever. And the peg value is what we're going to decide, which is going to be like, say, $1 or whatever, 10 cents if we start uh, doing an incremental peg and all. So that's how it's going to work. That's what we have done. And we still have like uh, some work to do. An open question is what do we do when we are above the peg, right? Because we also want to prevent, it has to be like a stable. Obviously the biggest issue that we're gonna have is when it goes under the peg, but you don't want like a USTC at $10 ever, right? It's not stable either. It has to be said between like, ideally maybe 90 cents and 1.10 cents, right? So we haven't decided yet what we're gonna do on the orders uh, be, uh, above the peg because it's less emerg uh, it's less of an uh, urgency. It's not going to hurt us, but that's uh, where we are currently. Uh, 
The other thing I wanted to say is that that's only one component. Um, Fafi, just to interrupt, so you'd need it a lot closer. If, if you're trading a lot of volume, you'd need it a lot closer than 90 and 1.10 cents. If you're trading millions, you don't want to lose 10% of value. So you'd, you'd need the peg to be a lot closer than, than 10%. That's, ra- that's right. So that's a very fair point. And that's the thing we need to try with. On the other hand, you want to deter people. So as you said, if you're, gonna, if you're about to trade millions to short sell millions in USTC, knowing that USTC is also uh, depegging, do you actually want to do that? Do we want people to do that? Right? We have to let them exit, that's true. But we have to fine tune the values so that only people who need to exit because they need the money or whatever, they can exit. But we, we want to, to uh, push back on the arbitrageur and basically what we call the toxic flow. If that makes sense. So, so that's, that's literally where we are. So we need to try to, to find the right balance between if we put a, a, a spread which is too far and we, we tax you too much, obviously it means we just won't have any volume and that's useless, right? Because we have, okay, we have said that USDC is $1, but nobody can trade, trade it. And that doesn't work. So these are the things that we're uh, basically trying to experiment or finding the right balance between. Or do we even want, as to, as you just said, uh, Rocco, just now, do we even want the tax to kick all the time? Right? So do we want to put like a, a certain volume threshold, for example? So if you're trading like $500 or $1,000, maybe it's okay. But if you're going to trade uh, 1 million a block, uh, do we want to allow that to, do we want to put the tax only for these trades, you know? So that's all the questions that we have. And the good thing is that we have the tool to be able to experiment with it and try to find out what makes sense, what is good, and what works best. So that's really where we're at. And that's very good. I'm very happy with that. So because that's really the important part of the work that we want to do, right? So that's one thing. That's the tax. Then on the other hand, if you remember, you have, I'd say like two things. Is The, the other question is like the collateral. How much do we collateralize uh, USTC? And then finally is uh, we wanted to do buyback. So when we tax, we want to get this money and we want to reuse it to buy back uh, USTC. So basically, when you buy, you push the price up. So you're depegging, you're taxing, you're making some money, and then you want to now uh, like use this money to help yourself back to the peg, right? And that's basically what we call an execution problem. So is it best to right away execute and buy straight away? Shall we wait? Shall we do it slowly, slowly, etc.? So that's the other questions that we have to answer and that we can also, we started to, to work with. So Kojak has uh, worked more on this part, I've been more on the divergence tax, which is cool. And uh, the other thing is that we need as well to, to find like a share of, uh, of this money to give to the exchanges. So we said that we want the exchange to help us or to work with us, but we said that in exchange, when we collect this tax, we can give them a percentage for them. And so that's also what we discussed before, that we wanted to make some reports to be able to uh, support, uh, you know, uh, our case, I, I should say, right? So that's literally where we are now. And we're starting to play with these parameters to fine tune them and all. And that's really cool. I'm very happy with that. We still have some open questions regarding, as I said before, what do we do when the price is above the peg? And another thing as well is that that's a bit technical. So tax so we said with tax you have the price the peg which is for example one dollar and then you have the market price but what value do you take do you take the execution price which is like the field price so basically like some sort of average or do we take the the screen price what we call like the market price or the mid price so these are questions that we're trying to answer or we're playing with and that's where uh, what we're doing currently so <coughs> That's on the algo side. On the architecture or infra, that, mean, that meant that we had to change like, quite a few things in the tool to allow for this flexibility and to be able to do these things and tweak the parameters and all. Uh, Bilbo is in charge of that. So you might not see it like this, but if I want to be able to uh, tweak the parameters of the algo easily, uh, it means that I need uh, a certain 
infrastructure in place or a certain design. And so that's what he's doing or looking at because, again, and perhaps you understand better why we took this path uh, to test off-chain and offline using Python and all, is you want, you have to do a lot of changes very often, right? So imagine like we find like uh, we're not happy with this, uh, this version of the algo. We want to be able to very quickly change it and deploy it and test it again. And when you have to do that on chain is a pain. It's really complex. It adds like a lots of uh, work, complexity, and basically that takes a lot more time. And with the time also comes a lot of frustration, right? So that's why we took this path. And that's why I think this path is like the, the right one for this kind of things. It's also like a standard. So yeah, that's basically where we are. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Lunatic, have you got any questions? I've got loads more questions I can go ahead with. If you've got a question, <laughs> jump in now. Um, I think you can go ahead because mine is more like uh, about something I guess. So you can go ahead about this one. Well. Okay, I've got maybe a couple more questions. And then uh, the audience, if you want to ask them a question as well, go ahead I've, or message me. I'll, I can ask them. So the ma uh, one of the points I wanted to talk about was the market module. So if you could explain to me, again, I don't know all the details of how it works. I'm assuming it's to do with the swaps, the tokenomics previously when Luna and UST uh, was at $1. Um, could you talk about what is market module, how it works, and um, the, the the changes we will have to, the redesign of it, if it is, if you are to repay USTC, how that would work? Yes, I guess that's, uh, I'm going to take that one. Uh, yeah. The market module uh, is very, um, yeah, it's something we've been talking about a lot, but something which is actually very complex. So what is the market module? So the market module is both, is basically a market maker. In crypto, what you call market maker is actually liquid liquidity provider. So like we always talk about liquidity and all. So you have a token, you have a coin, which is great. Now you want to be able to exchange it, to buy it and sell it, to swap it. Okay. So for that, you need someone to do, to do what we call providing liquidity. So what happens is that a person is going to put tokens into two pools, right? And, and then you can take tokens from one pool and put tokens in another one or vice versa, right? So... I'm using the visual concepts of uh, pools because it, it, it helps a lot, but that's basically what you do in, uh, in Forex or whatever. That's called like market making. So I, come, I have a background. I come from the sale, sale side, so that's the banks. So in finance, basically, traditionally, you're going to have the buy side and the sell side. So BlackRock is going to be the buy side. They're going to you know, collect money from uh, investors, and then they're going to go and buy on the market. Right? So they say, I'm going to buy Apple, I'm going to buy this and that and all, and hopefully I'm going to make like 10% or 5% or whatever uh, return per year, and we're happy. That's what um, the buy side, asset managers, hedge funds do. Right? A bank, what they do is different. So they provide liquidity, they're market makers, they're dealers. So they allow you to always be able to, for example, exchange your USD, for euros if you're going to travel to France or, 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 or anywhere in Europe. So whenever you want to exchange your USD, you never have a shortage. It's always here. Why? Because you have what we call market makers who are always- Sorry, could you here. repeat that again, Fafi? I think uh, I missed it. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry. So basically banks, uh, I was making an example. So banks, they're going to be like market making, so they will provide you liquidity. So if you want to exchange your USD for euros because you're going on a trip uh, to France or in Europe, you will always, you will never have a, so a shortage. You will never find a situation whereby, uh, or you cannot swap. There is no liquidity. Why? Because you have some actors, what we call market makers or liquidity providers, who are always willing to buy at a certain price and sell at another price. Right? And so the difference between the two is called the spread. That's what happens. And you can see it even when you go to a counter like FX change and all. So that's what market making is essentially. Now, nowadays, or even in banks and all, we do that algorithmically. So we have like a market, an automated market maker, AMM. AMM. What does it do? 
Well, it's a program which is always going to be willing to buy at a certain price and sell at another price. Doesn't matter the asset. You can take like BTC, BUSD. You can take like uh, PP, uh, uh, USDT, etc. But uh, like you will have like a market maker, for example, a big market maker in crypto, uh, like exchanges, sex have their own. And then a big one um, in crypto is called Winter Mute. Right? So that's a big market maker. How they make money? They're always willing to provide liquidity and uh, obviously how they earn money because they're w- always willing to buy at a certain price and sell at a higher price. So they collect what we call the spread. Of course, you have risk which, come with that, which comes with that. So to adapt this concept to crypto, uh, like uh, is Vitalik actually, he came up with something which is called like uh, an automated market maker, a constant product AMM. And Basically, you use what we call pools. So you put your token in a pools and you have like a smart contract or a program or whatever you want to call it, which is going to uh, make sure that it's always willing to, to buy at a price and sell at an overpriced. Right? So that's what you see is the swap. Okay? And the market module is actually just that. And I'm actually very impressed by how fast and how well they, they implemented it or adapted it because these things came in crypto. We have like, I think it was 2020 was what we call the DeFi summer. So DeFi is decentralized finance. These things are very new. And Uniswap came up with this um, implementation of this uh, crypto version or this on-chain version of the market making in, uh, I think it was like 18 or 19. But that triggered the last bull run. So you saw like all the CPMM and you saw like uh, providing liquidity and all this stuff. So, and then right away, and you can find it on Agora because this discussion were held in public. And so that's why we're trying to be very transparent and to update you and, and to talk to people like, you know, in the open because that's also great for people who will come later. So they're going to find the, the, like the trace of what we have done and why we have done it. So that's very important. And so when you look at the posts in, uh, on Agora, I think it was like uh, 2020 or, or 21, I forgot. They, they like, they've been talking about it and they've implemented it very fast. Now, what they've done, they've tweaked it. So everyone perhaps like is familiar with like Uniswap or on us is going to be on our chain is going to be like TerraSwap or Astroport, these things, these are what we call like a constant product automated market maker. So, but these products that I just uh, named, this, uh, uh, this contract that you use, they're implemented in smart contracts, right? So what they've done TFL, they've implemented the same, but at the blockchain level. Remember, you have like L1. When we say the L1 team, is because they worked on the chain, the code of the chain. And then you have L2. That's all the DApps. They're basically builders who work on products which, or software which sit on top of the chain. Right. So what, di- what they did, because Cosmos allowed that, so DK and all, they decided to implement the same thing, but on chain. I personally find this much better. It's great because it allows to do things that you couldn't do with a smart contract. So that's really powerful. And when you think about it, the market module is just like, uh, somehow I'm going to say just like a version of uh, TerraSwap, but implemented with seed within the chain itself. It's not a smart contract. It's not a DApp. It is at the L1 level. So that's really what it is. Now it's got some specificities. What are they? First of all, in TerraSwap, in Osmosis, in, uh, in um, actually Osmosis is also another case, but in, in TerraSwap, in Astroport and all, anyone can provide liquidity. So you can take your token, you're going to put them uh, in what we call liquidity, allowing people to buy and sell from them, and you're going to earn a fee for, for that. You're going to earn like a transaction fee. Uh, in our case, in the market module, you cannot do that. It's only the protocol which can provide liquidity. And I think that's, that's one thing which is a bit better. I'm not going to go into the specific of it, but it is a simple change, but again, changes everything. Why? Because I'm going to make it very simple. When you provide liquidity, 
obviously you're going to have risk. What, what, that's what we call like uh, impermanent loss, right? But then to pay you for this risk, you're going to earn the transaction fee. So every, every time like Roco or LL69 or Alex, they swap uh, against uh, my pool, I'm going to get like, for example, if the transaction fee is like 0.3%, I'm going to get 0.3% uh, on this trade. But I have to share with everyone who is also providing liquidity, right? And because anyone can provide liquidity, it means that is not bonded, is not bonded, is infinite. So you cannot estimate your revenue because maybe I've put like right now, there is like 1 million in liquidity. So I'm adding like another 1 million. That's cool. That's 2 million. And then maybe someone will come and put 8 million on top of me. Basically, uh, you cannot, if, you, tell, if uh, you come and you ask me how much are you going to earn by providing liquidity over the next year, I cannot really answer this question because I don't know how many, I don't know who is going to come and provide liquidity on top of me, right? It's not bonded. It's like an infinite problem. And usually we don't like infinite problems because then you cannot answer the question, you cannot quantify. And it means that, as I said, there are risks don't know how much you're going to be paid for taking this risk. And that's extremely important, right? So the version that we have of the IMM on the chain, which is called like the market module, this one, well, it's only the protocol who is going to provide liquidity. So in the protocol, if we decide to provide like $10 million, we know how much we're going to be providing liquidity for the next year. It's going to be $10 million. And then I can estimate how much volume I'm going to get and from that, I can estimate the transaction fee. So I can get actually a cash amount uh, to put uh, next to the risk I'm taking. And then I can see, is it, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? So that's extremely important. The way we have it on the market module, it means that you can actually manage risk. And that's really cool. That's one thing. And that was, we saw that it was a small change, but it changes everything, right? So now the other thing is that... Uh, Start with that and then I finish with the third point. So the other thing is that when you trade against a pool, like an IMM, basically you're going to change the balance of the tokens in each pool. And that also is going to change the price of which you're going to swap, right? So basically what happens is that that's a feature. We rely on what we call arbitrageur. Arbitrageur is like uh, people who come and... Uh, and, and make trades, specific trades to uh, on the market. That's their job, right? So we're going to rely on arbitrageur to bring back the price of the pool in line to the market price. So for example, if you have the price of, uh, like you have an asset which is currently at $10 on Binance, it is also at $10 into your pool. Someone come and makes a big trade, right? It's going to go, now it's going to $8. And then the arbitrageur is going to come. He's going to buy from $8 and he's going to buy until he pushes the price up to 10 and he's going to go and sell on Binance. And that's how you always keep a balance of, uh, you always keep the price of the pools or the IMM in line with the market. That's what happened. Now, the fact that uh, in our case, I said that the IMM is implemented at the L1 level, it's obviously great because it means that we can do the arbitrage ourselves. So basically the protocol is a market maker, an AMM and an arbitrage bot, both together. That's what the market module is, right? So that's two things. Usually a smart contract, TerraSwap and all is just the AMM. And then obviously people who come and arbitrage your pool, they make lots of profit and you make a lot of loss and you lose a lot of money. In our case, the market module is very clever because you have both the AMM the arbitrage bot and that's why I think it has been implemented like this at the L1 not at the L2 I personally proposed uh, to do a DEX uh, on our blockchain and I wanted to have it on the L1 as well precisely for that because then you can get like some extra revenue to offset the risk that you're taking so that's very important and finally the last part and that's actually the bad one or the more tricky one is that how do they provide liquidity like well, normally you buy the tokens and then you put them into liquidity, you log them. Well, in the case of the market module, they mint on demand. So that's how it works. So when you do a swap, 
you're going to swap, you're going to take some token out of the, you're going to take some liquidity out, right? So the price has been moved. And now the protocol is going to arbitrage itself. And to do that, it's going to mint some token and, and basically use that to trade against itself. And so what happened during the crash is that because people were constantly pushing the price down, it was constantly push, uh, minting uh, lunch to actually go and arm itself. And so that's how you got like, uh, and then obviously someone realized that, so he kept doing it. And that's how like you got like an infinite quantity of token uh, minted. So basically 6.5 trillion. So to make it very simple, what is the market module? Market stands actually for market maker. So that's a market maker. That's uh, an automated market maker on chain with an arbitrage boat all together and also a mechanism to mint and burn tokens. Okay, thanks for that, Fafi. Um, I think Redline has to go, so we'll ask him a quick question before he has to go. Um, it was just, to, I don't know how much you can say, Redline, but it was just to be, it's just about the your communication with the exchanges, how it's going, or if there's anything that you can share. I, mean, I know that you probably have to keep something to yourself whilst the communications are happening, but if there's anything that you can share with the community right now. Um, I, at the moment, no. I, I, if anything, we're actually not allowed to comment on this, the exchange discussions in any capacity. Um, I'm sure you saw I put up a tweet which I removed. So, like, just while the discussions are ongoing, the exchanges have asked us that we do not comment in any capacity on them. So we have to respect that they're the rules of the negotiations going forward. If we break those, we don't have negotiations. So, unfortunately, I cannot update you at the moment, but. As soon as we get the go ahead from the exchanges or they give us permission to share something, we will share that with you. But at present, we're just not allowed. It, it, it would terminate the discussions if I released any information. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I understand that. So, Fafi, I know you talked to a lot about the market modules. Um, so, for the for this repack to work, if 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 you know we can test it, it looks like it's going to work. We speak to the exchanges, we get the go ahead. Um, so we'll have to, I'm assuming we'll have to redesign everything, right? So we'll have to do the swaps because uh, the swaps are for when it was one dollar and uh, USTC was one dollar. So what? Uh, could you talk a bit more about that process because that's going to be quite important, I guess. Um, there's been a few concerns from the community that you know we need to make sure that we do it correctly so we don't have a, a similar type of crash like we had with Luna. So uh, that if you could talk about that next, or oh, Alex as well. I don't know who, who's the best person to answer that. I, I, I can take that one. I can take that one. So basically, the thing is that, uh, obviously, as I said, is like we have the repair, it works, etc. as you just said. Uh, there is one thing. Now I've described you the market uh, module in, in, in lots of detail. So you know that there are three components, right? So you have like the market making strategy or the LP strategy, the R boat, and then finally you have like the mint burn. So for example, uh, what do we want? To, so now we, tokens have been minted mostly. Right, so uh, certainly we don't want to, or at least like we may not, do we want to mint or, or not? So that's the question we're going to ask and that's the things we need to redesign. So basically there have been like, I'm going to say uh, straight away, there have been like some, there is maybe two axes, right? Uh, like some people want to just tweak a bit the, the swap or the market module and reopen it as it is. That's one uh, side of thought. And then myself, I'm not a big fan of that, right? Because, uh, because uh, basically, first of all, it depends what we want to do. And also, it also means that, uh, to me, I think this is something which is quite old. So that, as I said, it was like a Uniswap V2 kind of uh, mechanism. And that has been like quite outdated now. Now we are at uh, Uniswap V3 and Uniswap V4 is coming. And basically the big thing which changes between the, these ones is like the market making strategy or the LP strategy. This is extremely complex. So it's, it's not easy to design this strategy. And that's like pure algo slash quant slash modeling. And also it's not even like blockchain work or whatever. It's just like we're now we're talking about uh, market making and algorithm and quant finance and all this the concentrated so, liquidity of the v3 agonide that's right you remember I, I spoke about that like in december so i think personally we should definitely go with that right because i think one of the issues we had during the crash is that or basically when people talk about like we're going to add fa fail safe uh, feature to the swap 
to me, like the way you constrain uh, um, a market maker is not by adding fail safe. You can add a bit, but it's by changing the market making strategy, the algo of the market maker itself. So that's a bit more profound. That's a bit more involved. So and and for that you might, if you want to do that, that means that you need concentrated liquidity. For those who don't know, one of the big issue or big flow of what we have the market module or what we call like the um, the IMM, for example, TerraSwap or like again Astroport, Viva, and all, is that when you provide liquidity, it means that you're always buy, willing to buy and sell, but you have to do so all the way to zero. So basically, you have to be willing to buy and sell all the way between zero and infinity. And that's what, that's why actually makes a uh, rug possible because you're always willing to buy and sell all the way to zero, right? So there is a new thing which came out again through Uniswap, which is called concentrated liquidity, which means that you can choose to buy and sell for within a range. So basically, once you've, uh, like say the price of the asset that you're looking at is at $20, you've decided that you want to, be willing to buy and sell between like $15 and $25. If the price goes below 25, it automatically stops. That's very good. That's a great feature. Uh, uh, to me, I think that's at the very least what we should have now. But this to implement that is not straightforward, right? So because once you do that, I mean, you can implement it and then you need the strategy to define like the range that you want to, to be in. And that's not easy thing to do, right? So to me, the way to go Personally, I've been like a big, uh, but again, that's uh, what I think, and that's like we can have these discussions, etc. And it's completely fine. Uh, I'm big. I'm a big advocate to at least move to uh, um, concentrated liquidity, so Uniswap V3 like uh, Dex. And then on top of it, if you move to that, it means that you need to have like a dynamic strategy. So because in Uniswap V2, you are providing liquidity between zero and infinity, it's fine. You can just have what we call like a, a static strategy. And obviously, the, you saw the issue with Luke is that uh, it goes all the way to zero, you're minting and boom. That's what happens. If you want to fix that and move to uh, concentrated liquidity, that's cool. But now you need to choose your range and that makes things a bit more complicated and involved. So that's something to keep in mind. So personally, I think we should go down this road. That's one thing. And then we have to think as well about the mint burn mechanism. So basically the way I look at it is that, so if you want to, the way it is now, do you want to mint and burn as it is? I think it's a terrible idea personally. Another thing that you can do is that if, you make the right changes and you bring the right trading volume on chain for this uh, market module, then you can choose that all the profits that you make, you actually use to burn, right? So you still have the burn, you just don't have it in the same place that you had before. Right now, it's like whenever you swap, uh, it's gonna, we said it's gonna move the price and then it's gonna arbitrage itself automatically and for that it's gonna mint and all, blah, blah, blah. That's cool. But what I'm saying is that this mechanism to me is too uh, convoluted and it's very hard to, to handle. As you saw, like I'm a very, uh, I have a very risk management approach and there are risks I'm not comfortable to take. Uh, I, I'm talking from the algo point of view. So if I don't have a clear visibility on the risk that we're taking, for me, it's a big no because then you're kind of relying on some sort of chance or whatever. And that's why I propose to do like the testing of chain and all these things. So to me, you need to have like some drastic changes in terms of the algo itself in the market module. But also, we need to, I think from my, from my uh, opinion, my point of view, sorry, we need to revisit or think uh, in which place we want to put the mint and the burn. And I think it's not necessarily the best thing to put it... Uh, uh, where it is now, because uh, either it means that you have to, to have a very unconstrained system, which means that you can quickly end up like over minting, like happened during the crash. Or if you want to constrain the system too much, it means that basically no one will trade and it's going to be useless. And that's what I think right now. Of course, I need to study this more and to run some more numbers and things like that and all. But from what I have uh, worked out up to now, to me, if you just say, oh, we're going to change slightly the market module and add, for example, face elves, is either you constrain it too much and at the end of the day, it means that it's so constrained 
that is not going to move at all. Think uh, like if I attach you, if I attach you too tight, then you can't move at all, right? And then it's useless because you're going to put lots of work and effort and all. And at the end of the day, it's something that no one is going to use. But then if I, uh, I release uh, these tights, what's likely to happen is that, well, the issues that you saw before, basically, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, someone just DM saying that can we let other people talk? Um, other other members of the quant team talk. Maybe they're they're, they're tired of your voice, Fafi. Um, so yeah. maybe my next question goes to Alex. I've got a few more questions for you, Fafi. I've got, I've got a few questions from Rabbi as well that they've sent. But maybe the next question is to Alex about uh, the USTC supply. Uh, Lunatech, if you want to go ahead with your question for Alex. Um, next. Yeah, I also have one for Alex, and it's also about the um, it's about the collateral because I know that uh, he recently tweeted that um, I was stable that like uh, under collateralized, you know, like not zero collateral, but like under collateralized uh, that they're not dead. And um, like, what's our strategy? Like, do we have an idea? Are we going to have like, uh, you know, what I mean? Like, uh, is it going to be eighty percent collateralized, thirty percent, fifty, like? Do you guys also have stuff like this in mind? So uh, let's back up for a minute. Um, uh, so I think the the community has been uh, has been very clear that spoken very clearly that it does not want to um, to provide collateral to, to be or I guess to be forced through governance to provide uh, collateral um, for USTC right that's basically the the no mint the no minting uh, thesis now um, the way I the, so the way the way I looked the way I looked at it was kind of um, accepting that reality was like okay um, so if if that's just uh, like like an an, uh, an a hard constraint to work with, like basically like how can we reconstruct uh, USTC into something closer to a functioning product, like a functioning stablecoin, um, without that, right? And um, I think and so 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 basically like like. I, so I, I had these ideas where I was like, 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 listen, like, there's a lot of stuff the community can do to like, to get USTC a lot closer to the finish line to the finish line of like a fully, you know, viable product. And there are stable coins out there like, like Ample Forth, which, um, which have highly restrictive um, algorithm uh, algorithms and are actually uncollateralized and they do not they do not death spiral. Now they have a lot of other drawbacks that that have made them not the biggest success ever, but 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 though they're still in a better place than like where USTC is today. Uh, so and the, and then and then I think. And there's also the possibility that if if the community does get its act together and rally around a common, credible, and viable vision, that um, you know, I, I don't the USTC. I don't think is going to go to to nine point seven billion dollars for uh, you know in its current state, right? But but if the supply of right now right now it's nine point seven billion tokens, and it's like 1.1 cents per token so it's like it's like one it's like 120 actually actually i don't know if i'm not sure if, if i don't know if it's moved a lot very recently um but uh here again oh wow holy shit it's like it rallied like 50 percent uh cool well i'm gonna take complete credit for that of course I'm just kidding um no but i think so, so if it's like 180, 170 million market cap today, right? Like there are there are coins like Pepe out there that that are literally a joke that, that stand for absolutely nothing other than a meme that have one billion dollar market caps, right? So, I think with with a credible vision and a credible plan of 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 kind of like uh, compartmentalized steps that 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 are that anybody can read and 
understand, right? I do think that that if we if we shrank the supply of USTC down to you know 500 million tokens or a billion tokens or something like that and had and had a uh, a somewhat of an amp a, a more ample forth like approach i do think that we could create a lot of market cap and a lot of value from a narrative like that and once and once the market is kind of buying is to some extent starting to buy into that kind of a vision and the market cap grows, then we can. That gives us ammunition to to collateralize however we want later. So, so that so um, the short answer to your question is, we're not. We're. Uh, I, I mean, I do think that that in any one billion dollar market cap plus stablecoin absolutely needs uh, outside collateral in order to um, in order to have like credibility and survive in the market. Uh, but, but we're not at a place right now where we, where like we can just go to the community and, and, and ask the community to stump up, uh, to stump up, um, that outside collateral yet, because before we even do that, we need to deal with the USTC bad debt, the bad debt issue, which is just like, um, one way or another through, through, you know, some combination of ideas, proposals, um, We've got to we've got to to shrink the supp- effectively shrink the supply of USTC down pretty dramatically. So, um, so the post that I made today was that that first step of like like how can we as a community uh, accomplish that to some extent with like in a way that makes all makes all the stakeholders better all the all of today's stakeholders better off does that make sense it makes perfect and uh, I, I have another question if it's okay for you Rocco, because uh, i don't have the chance to speak to to alex at often um so look when you when you talk about the depth because uh, everybody's talking about the depth right and everybody has like um a different idea of what it means like does the depth mean that people are going to dump at no, prices what, and no. the algo doesn't? Like, what does the depth mean in this? In this, in this can you yeah, me, it and, um, yeah, it's it's so all it mean all I mean when I say that is like, um, so if USCC traded at one dollar, it would be a nine point seven nine point eight billion market cap token, right? That would be so. That's like if the debt were trading at 100 cents on the dollar. Okay. Now, I mean, any any just if you if you if you talk to anybody, any financial analyst who covers like banks or um, anything like that, uh, deposits are like a liability. Um, there they are a debt, right? A bank takes in people's deposits uh, and lends it out to some to somewhere else. And and the bank, uh, the the consumer thinks of that as as like his asset, like it's it's my cash, and I put it in the bank. But to the bank, the bank uh, like owes that money, owes that deposit back to the to the customer, right? So ultimately, so so I guess um, that's a word that I've used, and it's it's probably scared a lot of people, to be honest, um, uh, because they think, oh, like I'm on the hook for nine point seven billion dollars now. But I, I guess um, I guess what I'm trying to trying to say by say by that is um, for USTC to to trade at one dollar like without tweaking the supply at all, you are expecting nine point seven billion dollars to show up from somewhere and do that for you and and gotcha. you know and quote unquote, and quote unquote assume that debt. And my argument is that is impossible. There is no way in hell that is going to happen. So we need to shrink the that so-called debt down to something way lower than where it is today in order to in order to make mm, USTC I, viable again. Make sense? Makes sense, Alex. Um, I, I, have, I have like one question. Maybe it's, maybe it sounds stupid, but I was thinking um, all these tokens. You know, they 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 somehow. Um, they, they, they lock tokens up for staking with vesting periods over like three years for developers, you know what I mean? And then uh, 
the market cap is like somehow artificially um, shrinks, right? Because the to tokens, they don't count them in when they show you the market cap and you trade the token. It's like circulating supply times the, the price. So I, I'm just thinking like if like two, three, four, five large entities would be holding lots of USDC, right? And you mm -hmm. could like somehow promise them future yield, you know what I mean? They, they hold worth this stuff anyways, right? They're not selling right now. Um, so they can hold on anyway. If they would think to lock it for like three years, five years resting, then wouldn't it buy the community time to to grow this again? And you don't have to, you know, you effectively kind of burn the token at least temporarily. Uh, you know, uh, there. I, I'm very opposed to that idea. Be, uh, like, for, first of all, there's no um, there's no such thing as USTC staking. Um, staking when when you use the word stake. You you mean you mean that you are you're lending uh, your lunk or your Ethereum or your your Solana. yeah it would be something like a like a bond or whatever in a, in a contract something yeah like uh, but but for it, it's like like if you go into a bank if a bank if a bank down the street from you says we're offering we're offering ten percent uh, interest rate on deposits. Are you going to run in there with your money and deposit all your money there? No, because you're going to be thinking, well, what's what's that money? What's the money going to that's going to be generating enough income for that bank to afford to pay me uh, ten percent on my deposit, right? And it's the same. No, no, in general, it makes sense. But but my idea is, in that case, they're trapped anyways, right? They're like the Celsius debitors. The, the, their money, uh, the creditors, their money is like trapped anyways right now. And I'm thinking, like, if you guys want to, like, like market make and, and generate money for the community, you know, maybe if, if, if a portion of that would be allocated to those people, you know, then you can generate yield for them. And then maybe they would be agreeing to, to lock their coins away. And then we could, I don't know, you know. It, it well, just, that is, I mean, the, I mean, the, what, what, um, what the team is, the, the kind of the, the, the centralized exchange proposal that the team has been working on does move in that direction. But, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that uh, a $180 million market cap coin, no matter how much it's traded, you're not going to generate $9.6 billion of trading fees from that for an insanely long, like, like centuries or thousands for you know for thousands of years right so so it's good to to kind of try things in that direction but it's also good to say that there needs to be um there needs to be a drastic kind of supply adjustment as well and so i've uh i i was, was kind of thinking about about ways that the community could could do that um you know in in the way that that kind of makes the most sense and respects everybody's interests, um, everybody's preferences the most. Yeah, I guess I guess it's a combination at the end, you know. And uh, like you said, if, if if there was a vision, you know, where everybody would rally behind. I mean, we were like at five billion market cap almost with Lung, you know. Like it, it can it can grow quick if we are united, you know. It doesn't have to also stay at like two hundred million, five hundred million. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I do, and I think I also think that if the community, you know, rallied around like proposing a new slate of of governors to the Luna Foundation Guard, right? I, I think the community could get its hands on forty five million dollars that way. Um, you know, I have I have spoken in in some detail in the past with one of the five board members on this topic, and and I I. I don't know. I, a lot of things have changed since that conversation, but I do think that if if the community rallied behind a propose, you know, an idea that respected their interests, you know, so they have very specific legal interests that that uh, they have like you know a very f fucked up legal situation right now, um, and you know, we'd probably have to show a little more, a lot more organization and sophistication than, than what we have so far. But I do think that if a slate of like five credible, articulate people were put forward by the community to, to take over the administration of the Luna Foundation Guard, I do think that 
that that could happen, right? So, 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 so for everybody, just to understand, for what what you're saying is one of the biggest obstacles we had is the LFG locked USDC supply, right? Because we have oh, that, that, no, that that should just be, that should it. just be sent to the. I mean, that should just be sent to a burn address, right? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, for sure. But we couldn't because it's not in our control, right? But what you're saying is the community has the ability to to get a hand on it. Yeah, the yeah, but, but I, I mean, by, I, by doing the right yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, but I think and not like fighting all the time. Yeah, but also, you know, um, Lunar Foundation card I think has like uh, uh, 1.8 billion USTC in it or something. Um, but I did some work with with Frag uh, with Frag Verdig. Um, he helped, who you know um, executed the, the 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 request for me. Um, like we basically know through um, a lot of research that that a, a very small number of centralized parties own at least fifty percent of all the USTC that exists, and all these centralized and and and. So basically, a huge, like more than half of the USTC has not moved within the last year. Okay, in the last six months, that number is seventy percent. So, like in other words, if if an account had, you know, one million five hundred and fifty thousand four hundred and twenty USTC six months ago, it has the identical balance of USTC today. So, if you add up all the all the wallets. Uh, where like the the where the the balance of USTC is identical to the like to six decimal points uh, from six months ago, that's that's seventy percent of all the USTC. So that basically, that's seventy percent of the USTC that that has been just left uh, left for dead as dust, and that 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 could be burned, right? So yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Also, Fatman last year said, uh, if I remember, uh, you know, I, I don't know how credible Fatman is because, you know, he's controversial, but uh, I remember him saying uh, when this uh, DPEG thing happened uh, and he was like rallying um, all the rec people behind him, he was saying that he thinks the props, uh, or he said he has a source that says, or whatever, they did analytics. Uh, and they said like um, 10% of holders is holding like 90% of the USDC and the rest is like small retail. So. I yeah, I, I would bet. I would bet that like so. I would bet that like ten, like five to ten wallets hold maybe ten wallets hold fifty percent of all the USTC. Well, actually, actually, that's probably too high, but uh, but it is very concentrated, and 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 a lot of those entities. Does it make it better for you or worse? Is it that's, like better? That's better, it's, better it's, because it's that's better because, that's through, go, because through, that's better because through governance. We can we can do things to that to that USTC and and um, you know probably have a bunch of it sent to you know ultimately to be burned right to help to you know to to help. Yeah, it makes sense, makes sense. But I asked this because uh, it's uh, you know it's Twitter and uh, I saw a bunch of tweets where people are saying like, um, oh no, there is the central entity and they're holding so much of it, so they will dump immediately. You know, like like that makes no, no. We we have thing. we have to deal with that before we, we. These are all things we need to deal with before we re-enable the um, the market module. But but the good news is it's pretty easy to deal with if the community just rallies around it right from a legal point of view can we do that through governance and burn someone else's USTC I guess um, we could we could like hard fork it I, I think um, uh, so so basically I think the chain could vote I mean I, I don't um, I actually need to need to talk. I, I I have talked in a lot of detail in the past with Ed and others, and and everyone is very confident that one way or another it can be done. Um, uh, there, but there are some differences in in exactly how it's executed. But um, but I have I have in, heard a lot of confidence uh, in the past. Um, uh, in terms of how that could be done. So now I think 
as far as USTC, I don't know how I, w- I would really want US the, the hard fork of USTC to be honored by the centralized exchanges. Um, because if the centralized exchanges refuse to honor the hard fork, then then we would lose those listings, uh, and and that's that's a key asset for us that we 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 don't want to lose. So. Um, so that would be something to ultimately talk to the centralized exchanges about, uh, and get their, uh, you know, get the, the you know the th- the three or four really key players, and and make sure that they're okay with it. Um, but um, yeah, I'm sorry. What was your question, Rocco? Well, you're saying you're just like, was it is it kind of like legally and logistically possible? I think it is. Um, right based on the conversations I've had with, you know, people who are much better uh, blockchain engineers than me. So would like hard fork it, so if you hold like five USTC, you get like one USTC, so like burn the supply that way? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, there are a million ways you could do it, but um, uh, yeah. Oh, I've got another question for you. So there's a comment about uh, burning dormant USTC. Um, I've not seen a tweet from you, but someone said, could you yeah, ask Alex about I, it? I mean, I put po- that, that this is what I've been talking about. So I, I made this post on Commonwealth um, kind of uh, kind of talking about the dormant USTC. That's what I mean by the by by the 50 percent or ever the sorry, the 70 percent of USTC that that has been left untouched for for six months, right? That's it's dormant. Like it's, it's basically dead. Um, and so I, I would say that the USTC that's been that dormant is, um, is a really prime candidate to get burned. Uh, like it, it, it um, um, yeah. Cool. I'll have a read of your article um, after this. Um, if you guys have any questions, we'll probably go on for another 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, DM me or you can come up and ask. Yeah, maybe I can ask one more and then uh, we can let some people come up if they like to. Yeah, go ahead, mate. Um, maybe maybe that's too much. It's a little bit... Um, uh, so what I'm interested in is like, uh, I know Fafi's vision for the chain. Like... Um, my question for Alex is like, 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 um, do you have a vision or idea? Like, because at the end of the day, you guys want to repack USDT. That's, that's, you know, I, I would love it if my bags go up and everything, uh, and lungs does a 10 X or whatever. Um, but like, do you have an idea? Um, like, what are we going to do with the USDC at the end? Because, uh, we used to have this mirror thing and anchor and stuff like this. And I'm like a fan of, uh, re enabling this. So we can actually do something, you know, even if it's just just earning interest and let people degen uh, trade, and then we earn interest by borrowing the coins or whatever. You know what I mean? Like something. Um, do you have an idea or something in your mind? So I mean, I I, I can speak personally here. Um, I uh, you know I, I think I, I think you know my my long term vision is probably something pretty close to to kind of what I wrote in that nineteen page white paper from almost a year ago um, or nine months ago or whatever it was but I think I think everybody everybody here kind of agrees that a, a decentralized unit of stable account is would be a valuable product if it can if it has a a, a, a decent chance of actually working. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of demand for it in crypto, and and crypto right now is completely dependent on Tether uh, for that, and and that's just a very dangerous. Uh, that's, that's an extremely vulnerable um, state to be in, and um, I would say though, um, I'm I would be really opposed to re, to restarting the old anchor because the old anchor just paid out twenty percent interest to everybody and it didn't have loans it wasn't making loans at like 25 percent uh on the other side um and that's why that's why doquan had to bail anchor out uh he, he had to he had to he had to like literally bail it out um two or three times um and because anchor was burning tons of money um because they like 
everybody loved it as long as they were getting 20% interest, but they didn't think about like, like what was ultimately funding that, that, uh, funding that interest. Right. So, um, no, that's true. That's true. But it, but it also fueled the USDC, uh, hype, right? Because everybody wanted like, everybody was, yeah, like that, that, I think, I think was also there because everybody wanted that, to have the twenty percent. Right? Yeah, I mean that that's something that I'm I'm extreme. I'm virtually certain that if you know if Do Kwan were sitting down ten years from now and writing his 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 you know completely candid uh, memoirs of like what he would have done differently, I am certain that he would have um, uh, he would have not bailed out anchor that that last time um because that was what caught that was what blew the final bubble um that that ultimately blew up and i mean there were other things there were, there were there were other things going on too but that was certainly like his big unforced error gotcha. do you think do, do you think there is a let's say um sustainable possible path of um, relaunch or, or anchor like is it possible to, to redesign the protocol so that it quotes like realistic or sustainable rate yeah I mean we I mean the good news is that you know overnight interest rates are at like five and a half five or five and a half percent right so uh, and I know that's what I'm thinking you know I, it was like just a little bit early I mean I mean there are, I mean there are there are a bunch of tokenized uh, of um real world asset protocols out there now like tokenizing treasuries and stuff like that and um and i absolutely you know i i think but 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 the yield has to be grounded in reality right it can't just be uh, you know a number a 20 27 percent which is what anchor actually what it wasn't even it was a lot, it was even higher than 20 it was like 27 percent for a lot of its <laughs> existence um and that that's not sustainable so it's just like you know banks just like a bank borrows short you know borrows money from depositors and then lends it out to to businesses that actually do real do real things whether it's uh you know selling something or you know that or um uh or you know financing high frequency you know, lend, lending capital to capitalizing high frequency traders or whatever it is um you know the the yield has to ultimately come from somewhere right so um so yeah i mean i th 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 that's that's far into the future but uh, but it's possible it's certainly possible oh it makes sense maybe we can pay oh. from the community pool <laughs> <laughs> uh well i think a big part of this is actually to um start replenishing the community pool right because the i mean the market module is what is what feeds the community pool, um, and the or the, the oracle the oracle pool, I should say, um, um, and because the oracle pool has been has been slowly, um, I mean, it's I think it's it's probably depleted like half of its value over the last year. So um, ultimately, the you you reverse that by re-enabling the market module, but you can't do that until until you've um, until you've addressed the bad debt issue. Yes, yes, um, yeah. That's uh, another conversation. I think I put a tweet out as well about community pool and oracle pool and what happens when they when they run out. But bring the to bring the conversation back to the USDC. What would you guys? like to see happen in the next couple of weeks um, to share with the community like what can we expect from you guys in the next couple of weeks uh, Alex you can go for it okay um, well so I think so we've got we've got kind of um, we have the the proposal for the centralized exchanges and and that um, that's kind of um, you know uh very much in progress but i but um also you know the centralized exchanges they've got all they've got a lot of other problems right now they've got a lot of other stuff on their plate we don't really know we, we have no way of knowing kind of when they'll act and and so it 
in the meantime, you know, we should we should recognize that there's a lot of stuff we can do on our own as a community to to um, to to make to salvage a lot from from the wreckage here. And so I think um, I think all the stuff that I've talked about with in USTC is stuff that that the community could could get uh, you know could get behind whenever it, whenever it wants to. And, um, and, I th- and, and also the, the, the Luna Foundation Guard, um, getting involved in that process, I think would, would, would get the, you know, get some much needed money into, into the hands of, of the community. And so I, I just think there, if you just, if you just zoom out there, there's a lot of ways that value can be created here. And, and I think it's really just about building, building a, a unified um, consensus and narrative around that and, and executing on it. And I, I think, I think, you know, I think a lot of market cap could be created in a hurry if that happens. We all, I mean, a lot of us kind of saw a version of that um, when, when staking was re-enabled um, a year ago. And, and I, I don't, uh, I think that was a mu- that was a simpler case, but right, but but I think I think a lot there's a, there is a lot more low hanging fruit here, and it would be it would be really nice to to see consensus build there and um, and rally rally behind that. So, Kate, thanks for that. We've got Ivan's come up. You want to ask a question, mate? Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure if you were taking questions now. I just hopped in, so if you guys are uh, still uh, covering the bases, I can drop back down, and then I'll come back up. Uh, nothing, you can go ahead. We'll start rounding up now. There's, uh, we'll take a couple of questions, maybe yourself and one or two more, and then we'll we'll start rounding up. All right, cool, cool. Thank you. Um, so... Uh, I guess the uh, first thing is, um, you know, like we're all going through a lot right now. There's a lot of BS on all of our plates, Um, you know, so that kind (laughs) of, it sucks for all of us. Um, But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, where do you guys feel like... uh, and I'm sorry if you answered this question before, um, but uh, like the intent is to like uh, you know work in increments on the way through. Um, you know what is you know kind of the projection for for that? Um, you know as far as what you guys are working on, and um, you. Like, I I understand it's super hard to find a timeline and, you know, to give that answer, um, but you guys are working on it, so I assume that there's, you know, and I wouldn't hold you to anything like that, um, but is there, you know, something, you know, for all of us to look forward to, um, and how are things going with the CEXs. I understand you guys are working uh, on a lot and there's a lot to it, man. It's a monster uh, that you guys are tackling. So uh, I was just kind of curious as to, um, you know, those couple of things. Sorry. So what's your question in like 10 words? <laughs> 10 words. Um, <laughs> uh, so if, you know, what is the foreseeable future as far as projections? Well, I, th- I mean, I, I think a lot of that depends on how how the centralized exchanges ultimately react to a finalized proposal and what the community is able to do on its own, uh, which I think we've been talking about a lot of that stuff for the last uh, hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, um, so I don't know, um, Fafi, if, if, if anyone else wants to, uh, like, like, I guess I would, I guess I would say like, um, there's, I think you, you, 
there's a lot that's just up to the community. There, there's a lot of different things that can be done that, that we've talked about. And I guess, I guess I would say like, um, listen to the replay or something. Um, yeah, yeah. I can, I, I can run back Alex. No problem. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, like I said, I just came in. <laughs> um, so I, as far as the CEXs go, um, you know, uh, how has progress been going with that? Um, if you could touch bases on that real quick for me. Um, and, you know, how many more months are we going to get into the uh, market module for uh, USTC? Uh, so, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. So basically, on the sex, we can't uh, talk about it. Uh, so we mentioned that before, uh, Ivan. Uh, we really can't uh, talk about it. Uh, that's something we, we can't really address. Um, on the, I guess I'm going to make a shortcut, maybe or summarize your question as a, how long it's going to take for like for this proposal or for USTC or yeah. So. The hardest part is to decide what we want to do and who we want to be, right? So, working on this, and uh, but I think we've done some good progress and all. Uh, but then, there are many questions to, to answer, so you, you're going to listen, I guess, to the to the recording and you're going to see. Uh, but there's many things that what Alex was trying to say is uh, depends. We need to start having these discussions in the open and, and try to be transparent and, you know, have some homeless discussions. For example, doesn't matter what we do. Let's say that we manage to repay USDC. What do you do with it? Right? You don't do nothing with it. Nothing is going to happen. Right? So these are the kind of things that we really need to start thinking about and as a community. And I think that's why we try to push this kind of concept of being a uh, of updating or creating you a thread for on USTC on uh, Commonwealth or you can discuss it on U- on Twitter or whatever. But we really need to start thinking of USTC for one dollar than what you know. And uh, on the market module as well, uh, I, I discussed that actually in, in great 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 deta- details uh, before. So you're going to listen and, uh, and see, but. More or less, what I'm going to say is that once we have a clear view of what we want to do, it can like it, it's always like deciding what we want to do, which takes longer somehow, right? So then it depends how many people we have available to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But and I'm not going to say because the other thing is that we have uh, listed tokens. I have a personal for me like it's like I'm very. Uh, touch here on these things you can quickly say like hey guys in three months or even if that's not what you meant like straight away people are gonna go buy blah blah it can be like you know so we have to be a bit careful about that but i think we have something i personally think we have something pretty good here or we could make something good but it really depends on our ability to really unite and try to come up with a like a vision and, and execute it i guess that's what alex said before right yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, you know, thank you for that, Faf. And I'm sorry that I came in a little late uh, and I missed probably like 80% of what you guys said. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, ask those questions. Um, I, I really appreciate your time and I, I'll drop myself back down. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ivan. Um, should we take two more questions, Fafi and Alex, then we can finish? Okay. Yeah, I think Luna uh, Classic was next. Yeah. Hi. Hi there. Um, hi, Alex. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I just got this uh, idea for a while now. Um, how about if we denominate USTC instead of trying to um, buy back the you know the amount that's uh, missing? I mean, the, the debt that's on USTC. How about we denominate the coin? For example, the, if someone holds, let's say, 1,000 USTC and it's worth, let's say, $10, and then he gets like 10 coins with the same amount, like for $10, he's going to get 10 coins instead of 1,000. And then we try to denominate it to the market cap that we have, for example, now. 
and just work it from there instead of buying back all the coins and or you know because we have to make the money that's missing from USDC in order to repeg it and it's a lot so what do you think about this um so so basically uh, create a new token and and airdrop it um exactly and, yeah yeah so i mean um one problem is so that was i i made a proposal at one point along those lines like many months ago but i think um there are there are issues with that um i i think it's going to be very hard to to list a new algorithmic stable coin on centralized exchanges, given the history of what's happened to, to those uh, in the past. So USTC, one very valuable asset that USTC does have is its listings on several centralized exchanges. That gives it a lot of liquidity and actually fiat interchangeability that that would be virtually impossible to get today if you were starting a new algorithmic stable coin from scratch. Um, so that's one, that's one objection. Um, and then I, but I guess aside from that, so, I mean, I guess what, what I, a lot of things, a lot of the things I've been saying with USTC are basically like do a reverse split of it through governance and that, that accomplishes the same thing, but you keep the, the listing of USTC that's on Binance and, and the other venues, uh, which is very valuable. Right, right, okay, right. And uh, one more, one more question. Um, at the moment, we we are stuck with Terra Rebels um, wallet. Um, there's any news regarding any development of a new wallet from you know to be able to be totally decentralized instead of like using a wallet yeah, I'm, which... uh, I'm with you there I, I mean i don't i don't use the uh, terra rebels station um but i terra Rebel wallet um whatever it is but uh I, my understanding was that it was maybe maybe lunk burn steve lba or um you know some some people that were credible and associated with the L1 task force or maybe it was the L1 task force itself actually put up a proposition to to fund that at some point and and it actually failed to pass um that that's what i was told ha had happened um so i don't know i guess terra rebels still has a lot of validator cloud or something i somehow i which i don't really understand at all but um uh, so, I mean, I, don't, I guess, or uh, maybe there was something wrong with the proposal. I, I don't know. Um, but uh, I would certainly, I was actually just having a conversation with Frag about that yesterday, about just, you know, some of these um, really basic building blocks of, of kind of a, a functioning network and and I, I think that was, I think that was, uh, Frag or Steve said, well, the reason why we haven't done that is that the community refused to fund it or something. Um, I was, I was surprised. Yeah, I was surprised when I, when, when they told me that. So, right, right, yeah, because the proposal um, didn't pass. I think Happy Cat Crypto put it on, but um, didn't pass. So. At the moment, we stuck with that. There's nothing we can do at the moment. At the moment, so yeah. But I, but I, would, be, I, I would be very supportive of like, like a, an, you know, an L1TF sanctioned um, station and wallet solution. Right. Right. Okay. Then. All right. Then, guys. Uh, I catch you later on. Take care. Thank Thanks. you for having me. Thanks for the questions. That was a good question about the wallet. And I think Matt's market was next. Hey, what's up, guys? Um, Alex got a question for you, man. Um, have you guys run any type of uh, test environment? Uh, like if you would just turn the market module back on right now, being that they put the hard cap on the amount of uh, lunk that could be minted. Have you all done any testing to see what would happen? Well, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure our position is that like we don't, 
we think it's too early to to re-enable the market uh, the market module. Uh, I mean, there's there's a bunch of things that need to be done before that happens. Um, um, there has been a uh, a bunch of um, like modeling and testing in 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 our group, but that's that's related to like how how USTC um, you know how much kind of tax revenue it would generate under you know certain centralized exchange uh, kind of frameworks um i mean faffy do you want to this this is more in your wheelhouse if you want to elaborate on this yes yes so uh not yet to be honest um uh not yet it's like uh we have to tweak uh, a little bit uh the tool that we have to represent the market module in it uh because we've been I, I said earlier i don't know if you were here we've been doing quite a few change and also we need to stabilize a bit, stabilize sorry a bit everything but uh we haven't done yet but that would be something extremely interesting to do actually all right cool i appreciate it thank you very much yeah welcome cool thanks matt was there another question lunatic or should we start rounding up i think maz or i it um do you want to ask a quick question mate i think you've raised your hand yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I also came on pretty late, so I'll make it quick. Hi, Faffy. Hi, Alex. How are you guys doing? Thank you, Rocco, for making this happen. I guess my I don't know if it was covered before, but I know Alex was uh, kind of doing a deep dive into assets on the chain. And I wonder if you can ballpark that figure. What have you found? I, I know there was uh, the multi sig that was off chain, that was an old story, but from all your research, if you can ballpark what is really kind of buried in the chain and what are what are the hurdles how difficult is it going to be for us to uh get control of those funds to help the effort here so luna foundation guard 45 million us dollars worth of assets um the the old cross chain multi-sig i think has about three million dollars of assets um, and then, and then USTC. That's excluding USTC. And then USTC, we think, we think about sixty-five percent uh, or seventy percent of USTC is basically is basically left for dead, um, mostly in the hands of in the, of a very small number of um, uh, highly centralized. Uh, entities dating from before the crash um so so that which could theoretically be burned okay i mean and, and what kind of like it's easy to say that it could just be burned but someone is going to raise their hand and say excuse me um you know i mean uh, what how difficult is it going to be for us to actually get access or burn these funds well, through governance, I mean, governance can ultimately control what happens to USTC in particular. That doesn't really require, because um, USTC lives completely on the, the, the Lunk chain, right? So, so Lunk governance can, can theoretically control uh, what happens to that. Um, as far as the other assets, those assets do not live on the... Um, on the Lunk chain, right? The, the Luna Foundation Guard is, is an off-chain legal entity and they they basically have an avalanche wallet for their avax they have a, a binance smart chain wallet for their bnb and they have a, a bitcoin wallet for their btc um, and also those assets have um or at least the avax i know the for a fact that the avax like it has um they made some complicated like the luna foundation guard entity made a complicated made a, le a very specific legal agreement with the the avalanche foundation over how that avalanche could be could be used um and and so if the community were to nominate five people to replace the five current uh members of the of the luna foundation guard board uh that board would have to hold a vote and and they would have to they would have to basically trust the community nominees that these are that these are like credible people, you know, real, intelligent, um, well-meaning people who, like, 
have who have a lot to lose, like in, in personal rep, real world reputation or whatever. If um, if something really bad happens uh, after control is handed over, uh, so they'd have to, and they'd probably want they probably want those people to, you know. Um, if I were to, let's put it this way, if I were Do Kwan or Kanav Korea at Jump or Jose Maria Macedo um, from Delphi, right? Um, uh, you know, they have all these vault. Th those are three of the five uh, Luna Foundation Guard governors. And if I were in their shoes, um, you know, they're 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 basically fighting against this this you know, fraudulent narrative that has been, that has been, um, repeated over and over and over again that, you know, um, you know, th those guys were masterminded this giant financial fraud. Um, and, and they created a, a bunch of victims and owe a bunch of people billions of dollars when in reality, it was a bunch of DGENs, uh, taking a risk on a highly experimental, uh, concept. Um, and, and shit hit the fan, uh, as it often does in crypto, and and we've all moved on. And I think I think they would like to see they would they would like to see that you know the successor governor like they would be very, they would not want to hand over the, the foundation guard control to people who like who believe who subscribe to the false narrative, right? So it might help them to see some proof of work. Uh, from the community that, you know, um, you know, we're standing up for the, the financial interests of the, of the current community, which includes a, a bunch of people who were wrecked from like me, who were wrecked during the, the Luna, cra the Luna crash. And by the way, we don't, we don't buy into this bullshit narrative about, about this giant, premeditated financial fraud that got foisted onto people. Um, so, so anyway, that's a whole separate complicated process that, that the community would have to engage in and, and rally around. Uh, it's not something that, that any one person could, could just deliver. Um, but I ha I can tell you from my own conversations from like six months ago that there, that, and there, there was definitely receptiveness to that. That's 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 right. the, the answer for the forty-five million. Yeah. Um, very, yeah. very cool. I, um, yeah. Just one last comment because I know we're winding down. Um, yeah, I mean, almost fifty million dollars. That's that's of course a lot of money. But what's actually more interesting, I think, is what you said about. 65% of the circulating supply of USDC could potentially be burnt. I mean, that's a lot more than $50 million. And I mean, well, well, well the, hold on a second. Um, uh, you know, you, you have to, th if you think about, um, of course, like, like the mark to market value is, is, I mean, it was probably, probably be, be about $110 million today, but, if you look at a bid ask depth uh, of USDC across different exchanges, it's like it's it's incredibly low, right? I, it's something like you know plus or minus two percent. Um, it's probably like two hundred fifty thousand dollars of liquidity, right? So if somebody sold a million dollars of USDC at the market, they'd probably drop it like thirty percent, right? So so I would. I would caution, I, I, you know. Um. No, I, I understand. I understand. But what I was going to say was, is that, you know, this idea of a reverse split, it's uh, an interesting idea to help us get to the reped quicker, but that uh, basically takes away any appreciation for anybody that's been speculating in this coin. Whereas if yeah, you so we, so we are able to so burn... we wouldn't do like a total reverse split straight to one. We'd probably take it to, I don't know. 50 cents, 70 cents or something and leave a lot on the table for people who... Well, yeah, that's right. So so if you're able to actually burn 65% of the circulating supply before a reverse split, then you accomplish both things. Correct, that's exactly repay, right. Plus you show... Right, right, 
Right, right. So that's why I thought what you said was very interesting on that. And I appreciate you as always, Alex. Thank you, Fappy. Thank you, Rocco. I'll talk to you soon, guys. Cool. Thanks, mate. Um, I'll ask a final question um, and then we'll start. We'll, we'll end this. <laughs> we keep saying we'll end it, but then we'll carry on. It's about, you know, for us to get this USDC repeg to work, we'll have to all work together. The quant team, the L1 team, there seems to be a few questions that, you know, I don't like the L1 team for some reason. I don't know why I was at a PSX is here. He arranged it. I think I was in a spaces with Steve before. Um, I don't know Frag, but a couple of DMs with him. He, he couldn't join today. Um, but yeah, we'll all have to work together. The community will have to work together. So my question is, if... USCC is the next step. You know, you got you guys are going to test the algo, um, and then hopefully, if it works, I'm assuming you'll have to work together with the L1 team to update the market modules. So, if you want to talk about how the next steps will, will work with the testing, working with the L1 team, updating the working modules, and um, yeah, just the success factors. How do you see if it is to work? How will it work? I. Um I feel like I'm talking too much, but I, I mean, I can, I can take that, I guess. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, look, I mean, I, I've, I've always, I've, I've always had good relationships with, uh, um, uh, you know, had, had disagreements, but generally had, had a good relationship with, with, uh, with Steven, especially frag. And, um, and I, I, I don't know the other guys well, but I mean, there's, there's no reason why, um, in my mind, there's no reason why we we couldn't work well together with the L1 task force. So, um, but uh, yeah, you're right. It will take. It will take. I, I think it will take some kind of more um, formalized cooperation uh, than what um, as we get like as we get closer to to what we're trying to build. Right. I mean, it, it um, maybe like right now this second might. It might be a bit premature, but yeah, I mean that's that's definitely going to have to happen uh, at some point. Um, uh, Faffy, do you want to kind of address kind of the the rest of the question? So, so would you would you so after your testing, would you make a proposal to the L one team saying, look, th these are the changes we've tested it out. We think this will work. These are the changes we would like to make, or would you come to the community first for a vote and then go to the L one team? I, I guess cross that what? bridge. I mean, it's, it's all, all, the community makes all the decisions ultimately. So I guess it's it's a uh, you know cross that bridge when we get to it. But it's 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 always the community's call. Yes, I mean one thing I would say is that uh, first of all, the more we are, the faster we are. Right, that's like a constant, no matter what you do. Right, it would make zero sense to try to have less people involved. Actually, that will be like stupid from a community perspective and that will be very selfish, right? So that's one. The second thing is that, uh, you know, it, we know each other and uh, I think we have a good relationship and also I think it's not, uh, I, I think is that uh, I don't see it as a, uh, I don't see it as a, like, you know, them and us, etc. I mean, for example, Alex is working quite naturally with uh, Frag. And that's like, you know, we didn't have to put a pro for that or things like that. The other thing I would like to insist on, and because it's a recorded space and we have lots of people, so at least I've said it and you cannot tell me uh, later and all, is to me, it would make literally zero sense to, for example, get rid of uh, Frag, right? You have someone who has been around, uh, again, like Alex, I don't know the others, but he, he, I guess he applies uh, equally, right? So you have someone that you have, like, has spent time on learning the blockchain and working and all, etc., And then you come and you say, hey, can you like move on? No, you don't do that, right? So however, like for example, putting a proposal and say, can you implement that? It just does not work like this, right? So if you go to a hedge fund who does algo trading, it's like you have a team which is mixed between quant and dev because they have to talk a lot between themselves. And that's why I have in a, we have in the team, Bilbo, he's got like a, a more like, for example, dev uh, uh, profile, but we're integrated together because there are things that will take me so much time to do or like the word, etc. So you kind of need to reduce that bridge. So I think personally, uh, the sync the, the would, uh, I think it would work out more or less naturally if 
if we were to do something in this area. And don't forget that the market model is a very small part of the code. So we need to, earlier I spoke about like changing the strategy and you know for market making. Then uh, like if we have if it comes to that, I will for example I will probably like implement the strat and then like you know Frag will have to review it and then like you know. Uh, uh, like maybe he'll add to it or he'll complete with the test. I mean, if you've been like involved in a project of uh, this size or, or all, you see that like in a bank, you have a team of IT, a team of uh, quants, and within the quants, obviously you have quant devs and all, but they, they have to talk together. They, they're kind of they're working together, right? So it's, I think personally, I see the, the approach. I, I think right now it's like a bit new, fresh, so it's a bit of a... Uh, so, you know, it can be a bit of a sensitive topic and all. But I think for me, I focus mostly on trying to get the right thing, the right solution. Once we have something which works and we know it's going to work, I think it's going to ease a lot of things because people will be thinking of we get that done, no matter who does it or how it happens or whatever, we, make that do- we get that done and let's move. That's going to be the focus. You see what I mean? I think. I love oh. that to end it on to the moon. Um, it, that that was all from me, guys. Um, thank you again for Can coming I, here. Um, really appreciate. It. Yeah, Alex, you've got something make, else. Make to say. one Go comment, uh, and it's it's not really it's not really on topic, but um, it needs to be said. Um, so, somebody uh, posted some um, personal identifying information of some of the L one uh, task force members. I think it was today. Maybe they they posted it once yesterday and um, and posted it again today after it was deleted and um, and I just want to say that uh, that is just completely outrageous and unacceptable behavior that I, that um, that just uh, pushes uh, you know it it makes it makes contributors to the chain want to want to quit um, because they're they're basically being uh, put at some real put at some real risk if uh, if the laws change and some regulator decides decides that they want to uh, you know go after crypto more or you know this um, basically like like a lot a lot of you guys might you know for a lot of you guys Lunk might be like the first real crypto project that you've been involved in but um, it it just it looks really 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 bad it makes the community look look terrible um you know to the outside world and and it just destroys what intellectual capital there is that's left uh in this in this little uh community right a lot of people have you know some some talented people have already left to to do their own things and for all of them the 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 toxicity here um was a really big part of it and and as far as toxicity goes, uh, the, like one of the the most toxic things you can possibly do in crypto is doxing someone, and you base you basically don't do it unless you have firsthand proof that that person is committing some crime, like uh, you know, you know, rug pulling the community. Basically, uh, you, otherwise you just you just don't do it. Um, so I just wanted to say that. No, I mean, I, I was speaking to Fafi about this. I didn't know if I wanted to bring it up to give it attention, but it's it's absolutely horrible. I, I used to do live stream, I think it was four or five years ago, and I shared a screen that had personal information and some people were retweeting it and stuff. And, you know, I wasn't completely doxxed, but it was horrible. And even when I saw this today, I was like, do I want to be in the Lunk community, even myself? You know, if I want to be involved and I get DMs to be validator or support projects, and now I'm scared that if I support a project, what if in the future people attack me? So it's absolutely horrible. Um, thanks for just mentioning it, Alex. And, and guys, please don't do it. You're going to lose more talent and you want to be working together, not, you know, attacking people. I don't know what advantage, unless someone's rug pulling. I don't know what positivity or what advantage you get from it. So, yeah, um, just to echo what Alex said, it's, it's horrible. Right, Fafi, Lunatic, do you want to say anything else or even Alex to end it? Maybe I go quickly. So, yeah, um, yeah, guys, that's, uh, that's our project. So, 
you know, we'll try to share a bit of these ideas that we discussed tonight, uh, don't, or today. Don't hesitate to get involved as well. Uh, we'll try to share as much as we can and whenever we get the information. So try to, or if you have ideas or things, we'll make the tool like uh, open source is not our property. So go for it, check it out, see if you, you know, if you have some ideas and stuff. And then, yeah, I think uh, hopefully we can do something good. Uh, you know, if we get together and rally, uh, rally together and all, I think we can do something good. Yeah. Thanks. Lunatech? We might have lost Lunatech, but again, thank you for me. I feel really like in a privileged position to ask you guys questions and educating myself as well. So good luck to you guys. I'll speak to you guys maybe in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, once you've made more progress and um yeah look to the moon i guess good night all